for you to come on a walk with me this morning. It's a very specific walk from a specific place to another specific place, about seven miles. In the ancient times when this walk actually occurred, um, that would have taken a good portion of the day, actually. I want to bring you back to a distant land. Some of you may have been, some of you haven't, um, a good many years ago. Uh, We are going to be leaving the ancient city of Jerusalem, and we're going to be walking north and a little west to a small village called Emmaus, and it's about seven miles away. And we're on a very specific day. It's the first day of the Jewish week, Sunday. And you and I are walking with a guy named Klep. We'll call him Klep. I know it's a strange name, but that's who we're with. The three of us are walking, okay? You and me and Klep. And we're walking with a bunch of other people that are walking with us, and some, not very many, but some that are coming in the opposite direction from those villages in the northwest back to Jerusalem. But most of us are leaving because the Passover has just happened. Now, you and I and Klep um, have been very interested in a certain rabbi for actually many years. We've been following him through hearsay. We've actually heard him speak a couple of times in person, and we know some of his inner circle of disciples. We would call ourselves disciples of this rabbi, but not first level, whatever that means. We haven't given up our lives to follow him, but we've been following him kind of through the grapevine. And when we came into Jerusalem for Passover, because we're good Jews, and it's a mandatory feast day, and we love it, some very unexpected things happened. This rabbi named Jesus got in a lot of trouble, Uh, and the Romans got a hold of him. Uh, The chief priests were involved, and they actually crucified him on a cross several days ago. Uh, We we saw it from a distance. And then they buried him, and we were very dismayed because, again, we were pseudo-disciples, very interested in what this man was teaching. We thought he possibly could be the Messiah that we have been waiting for, but we didn't know. What's most peculiar about this day as we walk, and we're talking about this as we go, is there are some of the women, the closest inner circle of his disciples, who uh, went to the tomb where he was buried, and they came running back and told his best friends that his body wasn't there, that he was raised from the dead, and we were very, very confused. We had gotten word of this probably third or fourth hand now, and As we walk this seven miles, again, it'll take most of the day, we're talking about this with our friend Clip. It's very confusing. We're surmising and wondering together. We're just speculating and verbal processing, right? Among all the people that are walking, some a little faster than us, uh, a gentleman walks up. He's dressed just like a normal Jew. And we look at him and he says, do you mind if I walk along with you? And if you can imagine with me, we look over at this man. We don't recognize him, but there's something about his eyes that make us stop. It just sort of took my breath away. There's something so beautiful and attractive, but also authoritative and not scary, but something awesome just about his gaze, and it it took me a second. It took you a second, too, and we made a glance at each other, and we invited him to walk with us. And then he asked a silly question. He goes, what are you guys talking about? We said, what? Have you been living under a rock, man? We're talking about what all these things have been happening here. He goes, what things? We said, well, we've been interested in this rabbi named Jesus, and we've been following him, and thinking about him and hoping in him and news was that he died and they buried him and now they can't find him. And this humble, beautiful man speaks and he says, oh, yeah, you obviously don't know that all of these things were supposed to happen to him. That's the plan. And we said, what are you talking about? Explain that to us. And then on our walk, a very long walk, this humble man 
started with Moses and went through all of the writings and all of the prophets of the Old Testament. And it took hours and hours and hours. And he explained how all of them tied into Jesus and his life. And all of them prophesied about what he was intended to do, to teach and live, but then to suffer and die, and even to be raised to new life. We had never heard any rabbi talk about the scriptures like that. We had never heard anyone. And we were hanging on every word. It took hours. We were subconsciously slowing our steps so that we could linger in the story. We got to Emmaus as the sun was starting to go down and we just kind of awkwardly said, well, uh, you know, this is, this is where we live and so we're gonna go now and he said, okay, and he was going to go on. We don't know where, but he was going to walk on and then we had the idea, we looked at each other and confirmed with Clep, no words, we just looked at each other and they all nodded and we said, hey, would, why don't you come, it's been a long day, why don't you come and have just a quick meal with us? And he said, okay. And so we ducked into Clep's house and he quickly took some you know, stone cups out of the cupboard and poured some wine that he had and his wife had baked some fresh bread, so she had that on the table. And this humble man sat in the middle of the table and without us even asking, he, he took the loaf of bread and he lifted it up and he broke it, saying the Jewish prayer, thanking God for giving us bread from the earth. And when he did that, something happened. He didn't change, but like scales fell off of our eyes and we recognized him. We recognized him. He was Jesus. He was the man that we've been talking about. He had been walking with us the whole time. And the funniest thing happened. When we saw him, our faces changed and he looked at us in the eye and he just smiled. And then the strangest thing happened. He completely vanished, disappeared. It kind of startled us because the bread was in midair and it fell to the table. It was kind of weird. And we looked at each other and we said, very interrupting each other, we were all so excited. We were like, was that really? And yes, it was. And it was him. And then somebody said, what was happening to you when he was talking on the road? And you replied and you said, my heart was on fire inside of me. And I said, me too. And Clef said, me too. And it was strange, but we all grabbed a piece of that bread that fell to the table and immediately left and ran all the seven miles back to Jerusalem to try to find his disciples and the women and tell them what we had experienced. Starting with Moses, in all of the writings and prophets, he shared with us all of the scriptures concerning himself. This story is an actual story that happened on Resurrection Sunday, recorded for us in Luke 24. And of all of the biblical events, if I could get in a time machine and go back and be a part of one, it might be that one. Can you imagine Jesus himself explaining all of the Old Testament and how it tied to him? And he says, starting with Moses, I'd like to start with Moses today. And we want to at least get a, a, a small start into the study of a brand new book, the beginning of all things, the first words of which are very important. First words of great books are pretty memorable, right? Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four Privet Lane <laughs> would want you to know that they're perfectly normal people. Thank you very much. You know that book. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. One of my favorite books. How about this one? It was a bright, cold November day and all the clocks were striking 13. You know that one? 1984. Two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona, where we lay our scene. The start of great books are always amazing. The start of the beginning 
of God's revelation to us is really beautiful. It's deceivingly simple, but it reveals to us what the rest of the book will make clear and equips us in a single sentence. How does the beginning of the scriptures start? Almost all of you know it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. A very simple sentence, even simpler in the original Hebrew. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I want you to know that that single sentence is the only text that we're gonna talk about today. (laughs) But what we're going to do is try to wring it out for as much as we can, and then set our sights on the book as a whole, and um, equip ourselves with a theological framework that the book of Genesis gives us. And then we're going to use that theological framework for the whole rest of our study, many months together, as we go in and out of these beautiful and sometimes tragic stories. And there are some tragedies in Genesis. Did you know that uh, Genesis covers more of time than all of the rest of the Bible combined? It is an incredible beginning, and it is truly a beginning. That's what Genesis means. It is the beginning of space and time and creation. It's the beginning of light and darkness, beginning of sky and ocean and dry land and vegetables and plants and trees and animals and fish and birds and woman and mankind made in the image of God. It's the beginning of marriage. It's the beginning of God's revelation. It's the beginning of sin and the beginning of disintegration that causes and that is the consequence of sin. It's the beginning of family. It's the beginning of murder. It's the beginning of polygamy. It's the beginning of civilization. It's the beginning of God's promises. It's the beginning of God's chosen people. And what we'll do over 50 chapters in unequal parts is watch the beginning events until we rush and meet a man, and then we will spend a long time following just four generations from that man, living in at least two civilizations with blessing and curse and promise and threat back and forth, back and forth. One of the more important elements to remember as we read on from in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth on from there is the original audience to whom it was written and by whom it was written. I gave you a clue in our story from Luke 24, but Moses is the author of the first five books of the Old Testament. He most likely wrote it in the wilderness of Sinai after they had come out of Egypt in the Exodus, that's in the second book, as God is revealing all of this, when we read those accounts of that time, it says that Moses met with God, most likely wrote all these things down, and then when he came to the people, he would read the law to the people. He would teach them as God was revealing it to him. So Moses writes this as God reveals it. And it is spectacular. It forms the most important part of the Old Testament, the first five books called the Torah, and it is the most important part of the most important section. It's the beginning of all things. The Hebrew Bible is called the Tanakh as a whole. Actually, it's an acronym, T-N-K, with Vowels placed into the Hebrew, and it stands for the three parts of the Hebrew Bible. T for Torah, in for Nevaim, or the writings, um, the poetry and wisdom writings, and then the Ketuvim, the prophets. It's organized differently in the end than our modern English versions. It ends with First and Second Chronicles, not Malachi. But the first part has always been the first part the Torah, and the first book of the first part is where we will begin and study the beginning of all things. Remembering that the original audience was a large group of people were emancipated slaves but felt like fugitives because they left Egypt in a hurry. They were aliens in a wilderness with no home. They were scared, ignorant, and rebellious. Ignorant, I say, because they had lived in Egypt for over 400 years. That's much longer than America has been around. And few of us 
know the details, the specific details of the founding of our country. How then in slavery in a different country would they adequately preserve through oral traditions why God had even sent them there in the first place 430 years before? They were ignorant. God had to reveal all of that to Moses and then tell them, this is your beginning. This is why you are called the people of Abraham. This is why I'm called the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is why you're in Egypt in the first place. They were ignorant. They were scared. They were rebellious. Genesis fills in so much, not only of history, and it is history. It's written and intended to be read as history and narrative. It fills them in on so much, but it also provides a theological framework, and that's really, really important. So I would encourage you, before we get to that, and this really is our application, and then we'll close, um, I would encourage you to uh, dive into the book of Genesis. It does not require a seminary degree or advanced education of any kind to read and understand. It's made simple and plain, and it is accessible to you. The theme, the only thing that you need to track really is one word, blessing. It's a whole book about blessing, where blessing comes from, how you stay in the blessing, and what happens when there is none, which is called curse. Those blessings tend to hang on a second sub-theme, which is promise or covenant. And what you'll watch is God promises and covenants with man and woman is the threat to those covenants. The threat in the form of lies, the threat in the forms of slavery and murder and thievery, all manner of difficult things that threaten the the promises and covenants of God. So as you read, and I want you and encourage you to read, if you haven't chosen a book to study in this new year or you haven't been studying, Genesis would be a great, great place to dive in. Read a little bit until you can't read or um, life is just cramming you out. And then the next day, read the same thing. And then the next day, read the same thing. And read it multiple times and take it slow as you go. You'll be blessed by it. But track that, blessing and promise. Of all these things, here's what the book of Genesis will provide for us. And I want to build this as we go. Talk about it a little bit. The first Phrase the first words of Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God is the subject of that sentence and the most important word and part. That is what we are to see first. And so the first piece of a theological framework as we build it on the screen will just simply be that God. God created that Hebrew word bara. We'll see that next week when I get... Uh, about half an hour to talk to you about the most controversial chapter ever written in human history. It'll be fun. It'll be a challenge for me. Uh, bara, to create. Uh, it's a word that's used often in the Old Testament, but only ever has one subject, God himself. God is the only person who baras in the Old Testament. So it's a unique and perfect kind of creative action that only God takes. And it's that first sentence, the first words are, are sectioned out for us to start with the person of God. And that is not where Egypt theology would have started, and it's definitely not where our current theology in the world, whatever you call that, starts, right? We don't start with God. We start with uh, random mutations of things that lead over time some miraculous way, I would say, uh, to you and me in today. But that's not what the scriptures say. The scriptures start with the subject, God. I I would just simply add a second point to that and add a second word. God is. God does exist. And number three, God is creator. God, God is, and God is creator. I know we're building small here, but I want you to know each one of those points forms a very unique theological framework that sets this group of people, the original audience, and by extension us, apart from almost everyone else in their culture at the time. There was not one supreme God, there were many gods, and they aren't eternal, they were actually created, most of them, from the material things of a pre-existing world and universe. 
They didn't understand all of those characteristics or qualities of those gods. They were mostly capricious, and they only created man to serve them. So when we start with God, and God is, and God is creator, that sets us, as it did them, apart from every other culture. God is creator. That there was a beginning. Did you know? Perhaps you don't. Perhaps you do. I study this on the side. I have sort of like a wannabe scientist streak in me. I have technically a bachelor of science, but barely. Uh, Did you know that for almost all of human history, conceptions of the universe, what was above us, um, starting with Aristotle and Plato and all since then, up until about a hundred years ago, we thought that the universe was eternal and static. It had always existed. This is what Aristotle taught. And his view on this held sway for millennia. The universe had always existed and it was static. It was still. Well, there's a problem with that. Um, two men in particular, oh, along with some others, but two men that you might recognize their names. One of them was named Albert Einstein. He started to do some math, and he started to realize that actually the universe was expanding. He didn't like that, because if you rewind the tape, that tends to mean that the universe had a beginning, and he didn't like that. So he paused his research, and he fibbed a a little thing in there to make sure that it didn't expand, but that it was static, because that was the prevailing view. The only problem is the second dude, his name was Edwin Hubble. He looked through a 100-inch telescope in Mount Wilson in Southern California, and he proved that the galaxies that he could observe were moving away from each other. Einstein came over and looked through that telescope, and he and Hubble agreed. He said, my math really worked it out, but I didn't like it. And Hubble said, you can see it. He says, yes. And so now we have a universe that is expanding, which has all manner of implications. That was just over 100 years ago. So let me introduce you to this idea that God, God is, God is creator with a simple argument. It's called the Kalam cosmological argument. This is an argument at the beginning of the universe. Because if the universe had a beginning, what does that beginning look like? Who caused it? That's what the argument is. Very, very, very simple. Only three premises. Premise one. Everything that began to exist has a cause. Pretty simple, right? Following that, everything that began to exist has a cause. Number two, the universe began to exist based on these discoveries. Therefore, premise three, the universe had a cause. The question is, what was that cause? And how powerful must that cause be to cause something To be, you have to be above that in every way. So this is a material universe. The cause must be immaterial. This material universe is finite. The cause must be above finite, therefore infinite, and on and on and on. It leads to incredible, incredible logic and reason, which perfectly aligns with what is revealed to Moses in the book of Genesis, that God and God is and God is creator. Let me give you one more other example that just kind of blows the back of my head off sometimes if I'm not careful. And that is that life in the universe is living and existing on planet Earth and all of the universe on a razor's edge of tuning. What scientists, both atheistic and believing scientists, call the fine tuning of the universe. More than 30 specific parameters, like the exact speed of light, the exact weight of a proton or a neutron, the ratio between protons and electron mass, what's called Planck's constant, the gravitational force, the electromagnetic force, all of these things exist on a razor's edge and interdependently. If any one of them was changed just slightly, Life would not exist in the universe anywhere. Lee Strobel paints a really powerful picture. He takes one of those constants, uh, the gravitational force, and he says, could you imagine like a measuring tape 
that is so long it goes from one end of the observable universe to the other. We can't measure that in inches or feet. We measure that in the distance that light travels in a year. And this is billions of light years long. This is a tape measure. And it's broken up into inch segments. And one of those segments is where the exact force of gravity exists in the universe. Everywhere it's the same. And Lee Strobel says, if you move that, that's a very long tape, right? One inch. If you move that one inch to the right or left, you don't have life anywhere in the universe. That's how specific it is. And that's one of 30 parameters. The universe is finely tuned. Everywhere you look through telescope or microscope, if you have eyes to see it, you see the remnants and fingerprints of a designer, of an intelligent mind and creator behind it. Don't even get me started on deoxyribonucleic acid. <laughs> DNA is the most plentiful and powerful source of information in the universe, and information always comes from a mind. If you're walking on the beach and you see shells organized in the sentence, I love you, Nancy, <laughs> you cannot say, wow, look at what wind and erosion did. No, that's a language, and some dude did that to impress some girl. It always comes from a mind. The universe is finely tuned. God, God is. God is creator. What is more, God's image is in man. That's really important and revealed in Genesis. And what does that give us as a theological framework? It tells us that man is special and unique, not just the latest version of a blind process of mutation that makes us, for many atheistic scientists, no different than any animal, actually, or plant. We are the same, just longer in the process. Where does purpose, where does dignity, where does real meaning and destiny come in that worldview? Nowhere. But Genesis speaks differently, that God created woman and man in his own image and thereby gave them immense dignity and purpose and meaning. God, God is, God is creator, God's image is in man. We'll add another one. God is personally involved in man, in man's life, mankind. God is not the deist God, which sees in many worldviews a creator that spoke or formed the universe into existence and then spun it like a basketball on his finger, but then retired to the back corner of the universe and is just observing. He's not involved at all. That's not the God of the scriptures. It's not the God of Genesis. God is involved. He reveals himself to man walks with man in Eden, speaks with man and woman after that, invites them into relationship, makes promises, and gives blessing. God is involved in mankind's life. This is a specific worldview that is biblical and very, very important. Number six, God is savior of man. I need you to know that Genesis is broken up on this point. Genesis, the book, is broken up into two unequal parts. The first 11 chapters, and then chapter 12 through 50. First 11 chapters goes like this. It goes up from God's creation to the pinnacle of God's creation, man and woman, and marriage and the beauty in the garden. And then with the entrance of sin, we see the consequences of sin, the disintegration of sin that leads to murder and polygamy, and then the flood, and finally the Tower of Babel. After that first part, we meet a man and then track him for the rest of the time. But God is Savior is introduced in that first part. Once sin enters into the universe, what we'll see is the very first gospel message is preached there, and we track that for the rest of history. God is not thwarted by sin or the consequences of sin. His plan has never been in jeopardy, which leads me to point number seven in our theological worldview. I figured seven was appropriate for Genesis chapter one, and that is finally God is unstoppable. Sin, man's rebellion, woman's rebellion, forgetting of the promises, slavery, all manner of terrible things that we will see in Genesis. None of that 
causes God to go to plan B or C or D. Every plan that he had in the beginning is, uh, un, is, with, is not in jeopardy. He, he is unstoppable. Um, our sin and even lack of faith in the story never puts his plan in jeopardy. This is a worldview that's incredibly important. That first half, first 11 chapters is these primordial events. And then we get to Abram, an idol worshiper, landless, childless man living in modern day Iraq. And God speaks to him and promises him all of the opposite things. I will be your God. I will give you a land and I will give you a family. And then we track him through four generations living in two separate civilizations and we end in a place that we didn't expect. We start in the very beginning, the creation of all things. We end in Egypt outside of the promised land and we have no idea how the story is going to continue. This is the adventure of the book of Genesis. And this is what we're going to start. I wanted to start today, yes, with just a gentle massage of that opening statement, which we will dive into much, much deeper next week. You can be praying for that. It's going to be a challenge for me. Um, But more than that, to give a theological framework, at least seven points, there's probably 70 more, seven points of a theological framework that the book of Genesis gifts us and distinguishes not only you, your heart, your mind, your place, your destiny, your dignity, but our God from all of the other false gods that the cultures are claiming, or the fact that there is none at all in reality, according to the atheists. This theological framework is a gift for us. It becomes our view of the world, and I would submit to you that that theological framework that we just discussed, those seven points, is the greatest tool to make sense of what we see in this world. It gives dignity to all things. It even allows us to understand in God's way the terrible things like suffering and death. It is the greatest tool that God has given us, and all of that starts in Genesis. Lastly, I would tell you about another time that Jesus was in Jerusalem, that city that we left on our walk at the beginning. He was walking in the northeastern part of the city of Jerusalem, the ancient city of Jerusalem. Near the wall, there was a couple of pools together separated by covered porticos. It kind of looked like the digital number eight on an angle. Two pools, five porticos. And he was walking around there as he did often and many people were around there. A lot of sick, a lot of elderly, a lot of lame. He walked upon a man who had been there ill for 38 years. We have no idea why, but he couldn't walk. Jesus begins to have a conversation with the man. He asked him to heal him, and Jesus agrees. And he says, rise up. And for the first time in almost four decades, the man puts strength on his legs and his calves and his feet, and he stands up. Jesus says, take up your mat and go. So he rolls up his mat and goes. The only problem is, "Mm, it's a Saturday. And the Pharisees are always watching. And picking up your mat and walking is work. And they say, Jesus, you just commanded that man to work on the Sabbath. You're in trouble. We got you now. And he says this. He says, friends, I am working even today. My father is working even today. And he says, you require in the law of Deuteronomy at least two witnesses. I will give you five that I can do what I just did. He talks about the Father, he talks about the Spirit, he talks about his works, he talks about other, um, these beautiful, intricate evidences, the fifth evidence, the fifth eyewitness is my favorite, it's Moses, the writer of Genesis. He says, for my fifth witness, I call to the stand Moses. He said, you follow him, but you don't believe him because Moses, this is what he says, Moses wrote about me. And if you really understood and believed Moses, you would believe me. But because you don't really understand him, you don't accept me. Moses is his last witness. Moses is the author of our book and a book that has way more to do with the New Testament than it does with much of the rest of the old. 
what we'll find is that Jesus and the echo of Jesus is everywhere in the book of Genesis. It's perfectly um, um, related to the four gospels we have, parts of the book of Acts, if you can believe it, and is in perfect symmetry with the last book of our Bible, Revelation. There is a unique beauty about the beginning and the end, which leads most scholars to agree that when we read Genesis 1, we read the beginning, but the beginning is pregnant with the end. And Jesus is in the center of it all. This is the adventure that we'll get to go on together. What I wanted to do simply today is hopefully inspire a burning in your heart for how big and how beautiful God is in reality, always bigger than we expect him to be, and equip you with a framework that is the gift of Genesis so that we can carry that on into our daily lives tomorrow and the next day and hold it as we study Genesis together. It's going to be an incredible time um, in this book, and I'm excited for it. Let me pray for you. Father, we love you. We thank you. Thank you for speaking. Thank you for revealing yourself to us. We don't have to hunt for you because you have spoken. You speak through your creation. Paul said that your um, divine nature and eternal character is clearly seen. Psalm 119 says the heavens declare your glory. And so we do see, but then you spoke specifically. And then you came to be like us in the incarnation of Jesus. Thank you, God, for that. Thank you, God, for equipping us with truth and history that helps us make sense of this world. I feel burdened for anyone in the room who is maybe just struggling with this year, struggling with hearing from you, struggling with feeling close to you in this time. And as we gather in church on Sunday, just want to give space for a response. I would ask Father to speak. I would ask Father for you to send your Holy Spirit on us as we're here. And that for those souls here who have been living in some silence, some loneliness that almost seems unbearable, I pray that you would very gently with those beautiful eyes and the soft voice that you have, that you would break that silence in their heart, that you would speak to them, that you would remind them that you call them your own by their faith in Jesus. You remind them how pleased you are with them. You remind them that you sing over them in the night and you collect their tears in your bottle, that you have written their name in your book, that you delight Speak gently. I pray for every soul here and tuning in that we would get a tangible sense of your presence that encourages and inspires and sustains us for not only today, but this week ahead, the projects and the relationships that face us. Would you just speak? I just want to give a beat of silence for you to respond, call out to God, ask him and for God to respond respond to you. Speak now. Father, so many of us I confess, I get a sense that there's just a heaviness, a heaviness on us. Maybe it's about the year ahead. Maybe it's more specific. It's just relationships, projects, unanswered questions, stressors. We just open our hands around all of these things and submit them to you. Only you are wise enough and strong enough kind enough and generous enough, powerful enough to answer these things, to give us hope in the midst of chaos sometimes. 
So remove our heaviness. Teach us how to live freely and lightly with you in the unforced rhythms of grace as we walk with you, work with you, watch how you do it. Teach us, God. Comfort us. We thank you. You are so good and we love you. We pray all of this and give you great thanks in the name of Jesus. Amen.